Hello, everyone. Welcome to Southern Four Wheel Drive Association's TechNet. Tonight, we have a guest speaker, Dan Greck. Uh, he's got a wonderful story to tell, so hang on. You'll really be impressed by what Dan's done. Uh, Mike and I are going to take a minute here and tell you about the, the logistics of our TechNet. Uh, as you know, we give away a weekly grand prize. Uh, last week's weekly grand prize was a, uh, war a set of worn grab handles. The lucky winner was Chad Braun. Uh, so I'll get Chad's information and get that out in the mail to him very soon. And as you guys know, every week uh, we have a major sponsor of our whole series for the TechNet. Mike, who's that? BF Goodrich Tires. So BFG has uh, been a longstanding sponsor of Southern Four Wheel Drive. They have sponsored this TechNet series, and most of you that are joining us again know the deal, right? So you can enter for a chance to win five, not three, not four, but five BFG tires, KO2s or KM3s up to a 37-inch size. Um, but you're going to have to watch the stream as Al's going to share how you can enter for a chance to win those tires. We will hold the drawing for those BF Goodrich tires at Dixie Run. You do not have to be present to win, but each time that you join these tech nets and follow Al's instructions, enters you for a chance to win. You can also go to www.sfwda.org and become a member of Southern Four Wheel Drive Association to also enter for another chance to win those same set of tires. So what tech net are we on, Al? Gee, I think number 14. Might be 13. I, I, I don't know, but we've done a lot. Yeah, so if you've been with us since the beginning, you could have 14 or 15 uh, entries to win that set of tires. And if you continue to watch these tech nets, that can continue to grow. So always tune in for a chance to win those five BFG tires. I'm I'm excited, Mike. We're gonna we're gonna continue. Everybody knows we started these tech nets because COVID got in the way of our live training. We weren't able to do live training, so we said, "How can we get how can we get people engaged? How can we talk about off roading stuff with our off roading community?" And this idea of the tech net came about. Uh, we've had really 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 good attendance. Thank you guys for that. And uh, Mike Mike actually ventured out. And what did Morrison Outdoor Adventures do last night, Mike? So we held um, what we're calling our Off-Road Essential Series. Uh, we're doing it every other Wednesday night at Asheville Vehicle Outfitters here in Asheville, North Carolina. And it's a two-hour class, and we're just doing um, kind of an introductory to Off-Road Essentials. Last night, we did Introductory to Recovery. So we learned about all the different recovery gear. Uh, different ratings, how to choose the right recovery gear for our vehicles, and the different methods of recovery. We had uh, 11 people in attendance last night, and it's awesome. We were able to sit outside. It was a beautiful night. Um, Sarah even made homemade cookies for everybody, so it was awesome. So you're able to social distance at this yes. at this uh, at this face to face educational session. Uh, we think we think it was a safe way to do that. Um, Most definitely. So we, Okay. So We've got an uh, entire parking lot to work in. <laughs> all right. Let let's talk about let's talk about something else here. Let's let's talk about uh one of Southern's events that's coming up. I'm gonna bring uh Jay Bird and Bo Rose on the screen and they're gonna tell us about something very exciting. What you got to say, Jay? Oh, what do I have to say? First of all, Bo, thanks for uh, thanks for being on with us. Bo is our membership director for the Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. Um, he's going to do something very exciting at the end of this this episode, so you want to make sure you watch the whole thing. We have got some great, great, great news coming up with Dixie Run, and we're going to let you know about it it at the end of this. First of all, I mean, I can't wait. I don't want to talk too much because I want to hear what Dan has to say. I gave him an ice cream in Moab many years ago, and uh, he still remembered that. So he remembered the ice cream man. So it, it helped him on his journey across uh, Africa. But uh, we are going to have a a great um, 
announcement coming up on Dixie Run. Hey, uh, Bo, tell us about membership. You were gonna, uh, were you gonna set up registration? I'm sorry, I should have said registration. Registration for Dixie Run. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Sure. Um, we, as soon as Jay Bird says go, I have my phone primed and ready to press the magic button to open Dixie Run 34's registration. Great. At the end of this show tonight, after we after we talk to Dan. After we get everyone's questions answered about Dan's adventures, then, then we'll talk a little bit more about Dixie Run. Uh, there's some really important stuff, so hang on, guys. We'll be there in a minute. And you want yeah. to stay tuned. You want to listen to what we have to say. I'm, I'm sorry that we're teasing it like this, but you're going to love it. Trust me. And you're going to love to hear what Dan has to say. You guys, I met Dan Greck last year at Great Smoky Mountain Jeep Invasion. I learned about Dan's story uh, of his adventures, and I really think I, I think um, Dan is living a dream that most all of us have had at some point in our life or another. So Dan's on the screen here. Uh, Dan, I'll ask you to introduce yourself and just jump right in to your presentation, and uh, I'll, I'll follow along with the slideshow and try to keep up with you, okay? Great. Thanks, Alan. It's, uh, it's fun to be here. So thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, as Alan said, my name is Dan Greck. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent that I'm from a long way away originally. Uh, I grew up in Australia back in the day, and then I moved to Canada about 15 years ago. Um, and, you know, today I want to give you guys some background into the adventure that I had when I drove from Alaska to Argentina. But I want to put it in context that really helps you guys get out on your own adventures, because I know it's so overwhelming to think about how can you possibly do something like that. It's so enormous. Um, and then I ended up driving all the way around Africa as well recently. But, you know, that's, that's so like big and hard to get a handle on. So what I'll do is I'll talk for maybe half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, and, and I'll kind of run you through step by step how I got ready for this. Um, and it's really important to remember that I'd never done anything like this before in my life. I'm just a beginner. Uh, I didn't speak any Spanish. I'd never driven across an international border. Um, so I just learned as I went along and, and I made it work. And so the really important thing to remember is that if I made it work, then you can too. So the, the whole point of today's presentation is to encourage you guys to have your own adventure and to get out there. Um, so we'll talk a bit about my background. We'll go over the Pan American Highway trip. Um, towards the end, I've got some really fun statistics and information about the whole trip. And then if you guys ask questions during the presentation, I think Alan's going to collect them all and we'll, we'll ask them and cover them all at the end. And just so you know, everything is on the table. Don't hesitate to ask questions about money or about safety or whatever it is you want to know about. Uh, go for it. I'm happy to talk about it. So we'll go for the next slide, please, Alan. And so, yeah, a little bit of background. Um, I lived in Australia until I was in my mid-20s. And growing up, my family wasn't into four-wheel driving at all. But we did do the, the typical Australian thing to do is like a camping trip at the beach. So we would load up the family station wagon with a tent and with three kids and, you know, all the gear and way more stuff than we needed. And we would go and camp on the beach. Um, and that was the Australian thing to do. And, and I think that's where I, I first got my love of like the outdoors and, you know, sitting around a campfire and hiking and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then after university, I moved to North America and I worked at a ski resort like so many Australians do. And I really wanted a vehicle to get around. And when I asked everyone, what should I get? Everyone told me, go and buy a Jeep Cherokee. And I'd never had a four wheel drive before. So I honestly didn't know anything about them. But everyone said, you know, it'll take you everywhere you want to go. And, and it did. I bought the Jeep in that photo. That's a 99 Cherokee. Um, it was bone stock, but I bought it on the East Coast. So it was full of rust. Uh, but I didn't know that and it didn't really matter. And so I started going out on adventures and I would kind of, you know, drive to the end of a road and then go hiking or go kayaking or fishing or whatever it was. And then in the winter, I'd strap my snowboards on the roof and I drove all over the US and Canada going snowboarding. And so that's when I really started to get this idea of like, 
you know, these kinds of vehicles, they can take me to all these amazing places. And it really started to get like the, the wheels in my head turning. Uh, next slide, please, Alan. And then uh, that Cherokee, unfortunately, rusted basically until there was nothing left. Uh, so I replaced it with a little Wrangler. I'd always wanted, you know, to drive around with no roof and no doors. So I did. <laughs> it was amazing. A lot of you guys know how much fun they are. And, and at the time, I was living in Calgary in Canada. And uh, I was going to work every day. I had a career. But it just wasn't making me happy. I realized it's just not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so I started dreaming and I started thinking, you know, I have this amazing vehicle that can go all of these places. Like, where do I want to go? What's, what are my options? And realizing where I was in the world, if we go next slide, please, Al. Ah, oh, sorry, yeah. And so while I was there in Calgary, basically, I took my little Wrangler out every weekend. I'd get out of the city and I'd go camping, hiking, fishing, all the things that I love doing. And this was actually the most important step to me getting ready because it made me practice doing exactly what I would need to do to go on the road for a really long time. So you can see in those photos, I just had a ground tent. That was perfectly enough for me. Uh, I had a little camping stove. I had a little five gallon jug of drinking water, you know, a box of clothes, a box of food. And that was all that I needed. And I was super happy to just get out in the wilderness and and I went looking for hot springs and I went climbing mountains and all over the place. You can see I even got out in winter a couple of times. And so really the way that I got into this idea of like, why don't I go big time overlanding was just by practicing on the weekends and just slowly getting used to what did I need, what, what was enough and what didn't I need. Um, and at the time, I, I guess I would have liked to have, you know, big 35 inch tires or a rooftop tent or big LED light bars or kind of all of those fancy things, but I really didn't have enough money for all of that stuff. And I was going out on the weekends and having all these great adventures and I didn't need all of that stuff. So then I thought to myself, then I don't need it. Like I can go and have big adventures without buying all of that. So I started dreaming really big and we'll go next slide, please, Alan. And growing up, I'd always dreamed of visiting Alaska. Uh, I think I read Call of the Wild when I was a little kid, and it was always my mum's dream to go to Alaska. And so looking on the map from Calgary, I was really only like a three-day or a four-day drive from Alaska. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to quit my job because I don't want to do that anymore and just live on my savings. I'm going to drive all the way up to Alaska. And the more I looked into it, it's like I can drive all the way to the Arctic Ocean. I can go kayaking with icebergs. You know, I'm going to see grizzly bears and whales and for anyone that's never been, Alaska is absolutely mind-blowing and I can't more, more highly recommend it. Um, and then after that, I was like, well, kind of in the planning stages, I was thinking, well, then what am I going to do? And so if we go next slide, please, Alan, I started looking at maps again and then it turns out that Mexico is connected. And I was like, oh, I could just turn around and drive to Mexico. That could be fun, you know, like I've always wanted to try and learn Spanish and, and I miss the beach and going surfing would be fun. And then inevitably, when I bought a map of Mexico, kind of all of Central America was attached. And I've never really heard about Guatemala or Honduras or any of those countries, but I was interested and I thought, I wonder, can I drive there? So I started doing a little bit of research and I found blogs of other people that had done it. And I started to really think like, I could actually do this. You know, until then, I always thought it was for like sponsored people or National Geographic or whatever. But I was like, no, I've, I've got a great vehicle. I've got all, you know, I can go camping. I can make it up as I go along and, and I'll go and have this amazing adventure. And then so next slide, please, Al. The dream actually became, why don't I drive all the way to the bottom of South America? Uh, and I knew there was going to be a few logistical headaches along the way. And I guess deep down, I knew that maybe somewhere along the way, I wouldn't enjoy it anymore or I just you know, wouldn't feel safe or it wouldn't be such a great idea. And I always, in the back of my mind, I always thought, oh, well, if that happens, I'll just sell the Jeep and I'll do something else with my life. Like, it's okay. It's, you know, failure in my eyes would be never trying. Failure isn't trying to do something and then not achieving it. Failure is only if you never try in the first place. So kind of with all of that in mind and all of that as the background, 
yeah, I quit my job. I packed everything into that little two-door Wrangler and, and I set off and I started living out of my vehicle. And we'll go next slide, please, Alan. And so for things that I needed to bring with me, I kind of already had a really good idea because I'd been going out on the weekends so much. Um, so I did bring a big box of spare parts and tools. And I mean, nothing really out of the ordinary, but serpentine belts, radiator hoses. Uh, I didn't bring a spare alternator or a spare starter or anything like that. What I've learned over the years is that people in undeveloped countries, they're really good at fixing stuff like that. They won't just buy a new alternator. They'll pull the old one apart, clean it until it's spotless, put new brushes in it, put it all back together and it'll be good again for five more years. So spares like that aren't as critical. Uh, I had all my camping gear. You know, I had some fancy things like a guitar. I had a little laptop and a camera. Uh, I went to the travel clinic and got some immunizations. And you can see in the one photo there, I built a little storage shelf in the back of the Jeep. So that's literally just a little piece of plywood and it has that horizontal shelf and it also has a vertical piece behind the driver's seat. So what that means is when the tailgate is closed and locked, that whole storage box is basically locked in and no one can get in there. So that's actually where I stored my laptop and my passport and my money, my credit cards, uh, because the Jeep itself only had a soft top. And so that, that little storage shelf was actually the only modification I made to the Jeep. Other than that, my little TJ was bone stock. No different tires, wheels, axles, no winch, uh, nothing like that. Because I realized that I wanted to go and have an adventure and, and the going was more important kind of than the gear. Um, so with all of that, I set off and I hit the road. And we'll go next slide, please, Al. And so the rough approach, kind of high level, was that I'll camp as much as I possibly can, whether that's out in the wild like this photo, which is free, or whether I pay for camping, kind of whatever I could do. If I cook as much food as I can, then I'm saving money. Um, I decided from the beginning that I wouldn't just put in long driving days because the whole point of the trip is to like experience things and meet people and you know visit whatever the local stuff is. Um, all I did was when I was driving around, if I found somewhere I really liked and there were friendly people and there was lots to do, then I would stay put for days or weeks. Or if I didn't feel safe or it was kind of just a big dirty city or I didn't enjoy where I was, then maybe the following morning I'd just get up and keep moving. Um, and throughout the whole trip, I just tried to take advice from locals about where I should go and what I should see. So plenty of countries, I would drive into them, not really knowing what I was going to do. And locals would be like, oh, you know, you should go to this volcano and you should make sure you go over here to this beach. And, and then so before I knew it, I had an itinerary and I'd end up in a country for a month exploring all these beautiful places. Um, so that was the idea. And next slide, please, Al. And I hadn't been on the road very long. And we'll, you can go uh, a couple of slides here, Al, as I talk. These are just photos. I hadn't been on the road very long when I realized this was actually my life now. Um, I'd saved enough money that I thought my savings would stretch for about a year or a year and a half if I was careful. And this is what I did every single day. I found beautiful places to camp. You know, I would drive the Jeep kind of to the end of some old road or on a beach. This is a beach in Mexico. And then I would set up camp and I would do whatever was around. I'd go hiking, I'd buy street food, I'd talk to locals, whatever it was, what turned into my life over this trip. Um, next slide, please, Al. Just camping like this became my normal. Uh, I started to think of this as my living room, as strange as that sounds. And next slide again, please. And again. So you can see my setup was basic and not glamorous, but it got the job done. And what I figured out was that while I was in North America, it was a really good chance to sort of practice all of my gear and all of my setup and figure out what I needed and what worked. And I could always just, you know, go to Walmart or wherever and buy stuff and kind of get a camping chair, get a little tarp when it was raining. And then so by the time I got to Mexico, I was pretty well practiced in camping and you know, what I needed to maintain the vehicle and, and things like that. So I chose to drive down Baja in Mexico, and it turned out to be a really great introduction to Mexico. Lots of people there speak a little bit of English, and they were really tolerant of my non-existent Spanish. And so it was my first chance to sort of practice Spanish and start to get the hang of like, what is my life going to be like now? 
And so I got all the way down to the tip of Baja there. And then next slide. To get across to the mainland, there's actually a ferry. And next slide again, please, Al. And it was while I was on that ferry, so you can see my little Jeep there wedged in between the trucks. Uh, and I slept out on the open deck at night. It was a it was about a 16-hour crossing, I think. And then I chatted to all the locals on the ferry with my really bad Spanish pocketbook. And it was on that ferry, actually, more than ever in my whole life, I started to realize I'm doing something, like, really big. This is... This is beyond anything I've ever done before, everything I've tried to do. And I've read a lot of books about people having big epic adventures. And for the first time in my whole life, I, I had that real feeling of like, oh my God, I I'm kind of like on an expedition now. This is, this is getting serious. Uh, and I, so, you know, I had like a panic attack. I was a happiness attack, I call it. I was so excited. It was so, uh, you know, so mind expanding and, and exciting to think of everything that was coming. Uh, next slide, please, Al. And so that's kind of how my life rolled on. Um, and now I'll cover a few topics that people really ask about a lot, and then I'll go over some highlights as well. Um, and so the first thing everyone always asks about is what are the border crossings like, especially in Central America? Um, and these photos, actually, they're all international borders. That's often what they look like. So you can see, not a stressful place, not, you know, not scary, not intimidating. Usually I tried to go to the little borders because they're just quieter and kind of more beautiful in out-of-the-way places. Um, and every border really follows a very similar formula, a very similar strategy. And the first thing you do is you have to leave one country, and basically you get yourself out of the country. That means getting your passport stamped. Sometimes you line up at immigration for 10 minutes. And then you have to get your vehicle stamped out of the country. And so every country gives you what's called a temporary import permit. It's kind of like a customs document that just says, yeah, you can be in our country for the next month or the next two months. Uh, you don't have to pay import tax. You don't have to pass emissions. You don't have to pass crash safety. It's just a thing for tourists who are just there like short term. And it's really easy. All of the countries, they do this you know, many times a day for tourists. So it's, it's quite normal when you show up and you say, I have a car. They're like, oh, yeah, fill out this piece of paper. You know, it's not kind of out of this world. Um, some countries make you buy mandatory insurance on the border. Usually it's about $10 or $20 for a month. Um, and that's just like the mandatory third-party liability insurance. And once you've got the insurance, then customs will give you your import form. So basically, yeah, you get, you get out of one country and then show up. Maybe you drive like uh, 50, 500 yards to the next country where there's like one of these little boom gates that look homemade. And then kind of the process just repeats again, but now you're in a different country. So no country in all of Central or South America requires a visa, or you just get them at the border. So essentially, you know, all you need is a passport and they're going to let you in. And, you know, they'll stamp you in for a month. Maybe you ask for two and they'll give you that. Then you go over to customs, you get your import permit. Sometimes it takes half an hour for them just to write down all the details. You know, they want like the VIN number and the color of the vehicle and blah, blah, blah. And then literally they give you the piece of paper and they say, okay, have fun, see ya. And that's it. You drive off into whatever country you've just driven into. Um, and the first couple of times you do it, it is a bit intimidating. It feels overwhelming. You know, it kind of feels like it's all foreign and you don't know what's going on. By the time you've done it three or four times, it's actually really easy. And by the time I was down in South America, it's not even an event. It's kind of like crossing between the US and Canada it's it's really easy and it's straightforward and you know what to expect. So I know some people hype up the borders and make them sound like the worst places on earth, but I, I've i never had a bad border crossing and I've crossed like 60 of them. So I think keep a smile on your face and shake hands and say hello goes a really long way to, to having a, an easy border crossing. Uh, so that's, that's the borders. Uh, next slide, please, Al. Next topic that everyone always asks about is, you know, bribery. How many times did people try to get money off you? Um, and bribery takes a lot of different shapes and forms. You know, sometimes it's just a guy at the border who says, oh, yeah, you know, just uh, pay me $10 to lower the boom gate. And it, it's kind of up to you how you respond to this. You know, sometimes policemen will pull you over and they'll kind of look over your vehicle and then they'll say, oh, 
there's too much mud on your license plate, you know, that's a $50 fine. That's an option. Or they look around and, you know, you don't have a fire extinguisher, so they say that's $20. That's kind of how it goes, and that's usually about how stressful it is. They're certainly not going to point guns at you. They're certainly not going to be, like, angry or violent. 99% of the time, I found, they're just trying their luck. They're just sort of more asking for money more than they are demanding it. Um, And so I would say I probably got asked 40-ish times for money, sometimes directly, sometimes it was kind of alluded to. Sometimes it was really obvious, like in Colombia. They pulled me over and they were searching the whole Jeep and and it just became really obvious if I had given them $20, they were going to leave me alone. Uh, But I didn't give them $20, so it kind of just took half an hour and then eventually they just left of their own accord. So how you respond to bribery is it often comes down to you. It comes down to whether you kind of feel a bit intimidated and you're not sure. And then, you know, sometimes once I gave $5 actually on the whole trip and that made the whole situation go away and then I was able to get on my way. Whereas, you know, every other time I just stood my ground and I was really polite and friendly. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Could you please write me a ticket, sir? I'll go to the bank to pay that. I need a ticket. You must give me a receipt. Just like that, and after five or ten minutes, they're like, ah, this guy's annoying, go away. So bribery again, it's a little bit intimidating at first, definitely, but now I don't even consider it like scary or intimidating. It's just something you get used to. And to be quite honest with you, it can be really funny sometimes when you kind of predict what they're going to say next and you, you almost finish their sentence before they do and then they get really confused. And you're like, okay, sir, have a good day as you drive away. Um, So yeah, I'd say don't be intimidated about corruption and bribery. It can happen, but it's not going to ruin your trip. It's not going to define your trip. Uh, It's just one of those things you deal with and it'll it'll be okay. Uh, Next slide, please, Al. And funny enough, before I hit the road, this was actually back in about 2009, Before I hit the road, I had never even heard of the word overland or overlanding, which I guess is kind of the big buzzword now in four-wheel driving. Uh, And I had no idea that there is a huge community of people doing it. And I bumped into quite a few along the way, people who've driven all the way around the world, people who've driven many continents uh, and who are having a great time doing it. And it really, it isn't just for National Geographic people. It isn't just for, you know, sponsored people. It's ordinary folks who have regular jobs, who save and save for years and years, and then they get out and they go on these big trips and they have amazing time. Um, And so what I learned is there's such a big community of people doing it, they always want to help other people. So you can jump online, there's Facebook groups, there's forums, and you can ask, you know, what do I need to drive into Costa Rica? You'll get a reply from someone who's like, oh yeah, I did it last month. You know, they asked for a copy of my driver's license and nothing else. So the community is really helpful and it's, uh, it's a really great way to, you know, get the knowledge that you need. So yeah, it's, it's really cool, this whole overlanding thing that's sprung up and become so popular. Uh, next slide, please, Al. So I already saw the question pop up. Somebody asked, what did I do about the Darien Gap? Um, most of you probably know there actually is no road from Panama to Colombia. So I've zoomed in there on the map. That's right where Central America joins South America. There's a big jungly swamp area and they've never built a road. And it's kind of always been rebels there. It's a pretty dangerous place. Uh, Next slide, please, Al, is a small update. It turns out it has been driven. uh, If you go back one, is there one slide? No, maybe we've missed that slide. It turns out it has been driven a couple of times. Most of you know Mark Smith did it in the expedition De Las Americas, uh, but it's an enormous undertaking through the jungle. Uh, I think the first vehicle ever to do it took 741 days to drive like 150 miles. (laughs) So you can imagine that's not something that I was interested in doing. Uh, And to be honest with you, nobody does it. It, you know, it gets driven maybe like once in a decade. So it's not, it's not something that ordinary or regular folk even really entertain the idea of doing it. Um, so the alternative is you ship your vehicle from Panama to Colombia. And there was a ferry at one point, but it goes bankrupt and the government always shuts it down. So the way you do it now is you ship inside of a shipping container. 
Uh, and you can see there on the bottom right, that's my little Jeep loaded in a container. Um, and I teamed up with a French couple who were driving a Defender 110 all around the world. And so by doing that, we were able to split the costs and like work together on the paperwork and stuff. Um, and shipping, it's kind of like a big logistical hurdle, but it's kind of really rewarding. And it feels like you've achieved something when you finally get success. Because it's kind of like a week of paperwork and different government offices and stamps and customs and who even knows why you need so much paperwork. Um, but anyway, you end up feeling this real sense of satisfaction. You drive your vehicles into the shipping container. It gets ocean freighted on one of those massive ocean you know, cargo ships. And then we had to fly on a plane. It's only about an hour flight from Panama to Colombia. And then the whole process repeats in reverse. And next slide, please, Al. It's really, really mind-blowing when you drive your vehicle out of a shipping container and then you drive out and you're on the streets of Colombia and you're in South America. And so for me, it was like a huge moment to like, you know, I bought this Jeep in Canada. I drove it from Alaska and now I'm in South America. Like I've driven my car to a different continent. It was, it was an unbelievable feeling and it was, it was kind of intimidating and kind of overwhelming because Central America is like relatively small and contained. South America is just ginormous. And suddenly it was like, my God, I could get lost down here for years. Like it's so big. Um, so it was exciting, but it was also intimidating. Um, but it was, you know, a huge new chapter in the trip opened up of like, you know, I've left South and I've left uh, North and Central America behind and now I'm starting into South America. Uh, next slide, please, Al. And so on that, uh, getting into South America, navigation became a real issue. So this is Central America and you can kind of see there's really only one road. Uh, for most of Central America, as long as you're going south, you probably go on the right way. And even if you detour off to the coast or whatever, it's not too hard to find your way back. And, and actually, on the whole trip, I had no digital navigation at all. I had no GPS. I had no phone. It was before cell phones, really. Uh, so I had paper maps, and I asked a lot of locals for directions because I was always slightly lost. So next slide, please, Al. We can just do a bit of a rundown here for everyone's Spanish. Pretty quickly, I had to learn, you know, I'd ask which way to something. And so straight ahead is recto, to the right, derecho, back, atrás, or to the left, izquierda. And so, you know, I had all these words and I'm trying to understand. But it turns out that all of that is a total waste of time because no matter where you're trying to get to, next slide, please, Al, the direction is always just recto. And it's this hilarious, like, cultural difference between Latin America and our world. They're just like, oh, yeah, it's that way and it's not far. And not far could mean 10 minutes or it could mean five hours. It kind of makes no difference. Uh, and this was hilarious a few times. I would even ask policemen for directions. And one of them would adamantly say that way. And one of them would turn around and point the other way and be adamant it was the other direction. So, so getting lost became like a bit of a feature of the trip. And just bumping into locals and asking them for directions really became my day to day. And it was fun. It was cool to interact with so many locals. But at the same time, navigation got really stressful, especially in the mega cities. Uh, in Quito in Ecuador, it took me four hours to get out of the city because it's so enormous. Uh, same story in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So these days I do have a GPS uh, and it's totally changed my trips. I, you know, kind of removed that whole stress from the trips. Uh, next slide, please, Al. People always ask what were the roads like? and Something to keep in mind when you're overlanding, when you're going international, if you're trying to get somewhere interesting, you're trying to get to a border crossing, a river, a lake, a mountain, whatever it happens to be, locals are driving there. So there is a road and chances are the locals are driving it with bald tires and probably don't even have four wheel drive. So what that means is if you bring your four wheel drive along, you're going to make it. It's pretty safe to say the roads are not going to be you know, this isn't a wheeling trip. We're not in Moab doing, you know, the hardest trails. These are just back roads that go to beautiful places. So you can see the kind of conditions. Yeah, there's mud, there's clay. Sometimes there'll be a river crossing, but locals are driving them. So locals have done whatever necessary, you know, to keep the roads manageable. And it doesn't really make sense that you're going to need, you know, a rock crawler on 37-inch tires because no local has that. So 
anything like that wouldn't really go anywhere. It would kind of be more just like playing off the side of a road or in some canyon. Um, but you learn pretty quickly you're not too interested in pushing your vehicle hard because you're literally 5,000 miles from anyone that speaks English. you 20,000 miles from home, you know, thousands of miles from paths or, or any way to rebuild, you know, things that break. So sometimes you see really cool stuff that might be fun to go and, you know, play on with your four-wheel drive and you drive around it because you say this isn't the time to go breaking drive shafts or to, you know, bash the oil pan on something. This is the time to be conservative and, you know, vehicle preservation becomes a real thing. So the roads, you know, a, a bone stock four-wheel drive is going to go everywhere that you want to go in Latin America. Uh, next slide, please, Al. On the topic of roads, some of you might recognize this sign, uh, the South Youngest Road. Uh, Top Gear made it really famous when they drove it. So this is called the Death Road in Bolivia. This at one point was the world's most deadly road. Uh, many hundreds of people a year were killed on this road. And this, what you're about to watch, is actually the only video that I ever filmed in South America. Uh, so Ali, you could bring up the video, please. Hopefully the sound works. Yeah, go ahead, Al, if it will play. So here we are, the world's most dangerous road. I wanted to give you guys an idea what it looks like. It's, uh, it's pretty gnarly. Sorry, I'm gonna hold the camera one hand and drive with my other hand. So here comes a gear change. So just bear in mind, this is a two lane road. I just passed a truck going the other direction. These are waterfalls above me and uh, my window's open. No guardrails, no signs. It's, uh, it's a pretty full on Google road. It's really good fun. So you probably heard I tapped my horn a couple of times as I was coming around that hairpin corner. And that's what makes the road so dangerous is the way that locals drive. They often come around hairpin corners on the wrong side of the road going fast. Uh, and that's why, you know, so many vehicles went off the cliff on that road. Um, but these days it's been bypassed. There's a more major route. So it really is just kind of a tourist thing. Lots of people actually ride it on mountain bikes. Um, but that was, you know... That was what the roads can look like in Bolivia and Peru especially had a lot of roads like that. Uh, back to the slides, please, Al. I can't remember what comes next. Oh, yeah, so now I'll touch on a few highlights. Uh, you've probably heard of the Ayuni salt flats in Bolivia. So these are the world's biggest salt flats in this super, super remote area. And it was so remote, in fact, that I decided to team up with some other overlanders uh, and so Warren and Sarah there, they're in that forerunner. They drove that down from California. And then Rob actually was riding a Harley that he'd ridden down from somewhere in the US. I can't remember where. And so together, the three vehicles, we teamed up and we drove all the way across the salt flats. We can go next slide, please, Al. All the way across the salt flats and then down into the, the Atacama Desert, which is kind of the border between Bolivia and Chile. Uh, and you can see the salt flats are breathtaking. Um, next slide, please. It's kind of hundreds of miles in any direction of just flat white salt. And then eventually you come off the salt and you wind up in this desert, which is equally as beautiful. And we're, I'm going to say, three or 400 miles away from anything, you know, from a town, from gas, from electricity. And so we spent, I think it was about a week out here traversing this landscape. Some days I think we only made 60 miles because the conditions were so rough and the dust was horrendous. Um, next slide, please, Al. And so it was out here, you know, these stunning landscapes kind of don't even seem real. Uh, and I loved it so much being out there in the wilderness. Uh, next one, please. And then actually, this is the international border between Bolivia and Chile. So <laughs> pretty remote, not many people around. 
And actually doing that stretch, that segment is really what got me fired up to look into Africa and start researching and planning because I love being remote like that. And then that's, that's kind of what spurred me on to, to go to Africa. Uh, so the Uni Salt Flats is a real highlight. Anyone that goes to Bolivia is going to definitely visit. It's beautiful. Uh, next, please, Al. So after that, I moved further south and actually my family flew into Buenos Aires in Argentina and we had a big family Christmas together. So it was pretty fun that they flew there, but I drove there. Uh, and so we had my little Jeep and I was like shuttling everyone around down to the beach and to the airport and back. And so we had a really fun Christmas together as a family. And then from there, I continued on and I drove all the way to the southern tip of Argentina. And that bottom right hand photo, that's me sitting in front of the sign. Uh, the ocean is about 50 yards behind that sign. That is physically as far as you can drive. And so that was it. I completed the whole trip. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a real bittersweet moment because I was excited to finish, but also kind of a bit lost and I didn't know what to do next. So I didn't want to quite give up the trip. So I actually moved south, uh, moved north a little bit through Patagonia. And I did a lot of hiking in Patagonia. Um, so we can go through the next slides, please, Al. Probably you can just click next every few seconds. So hiking highlights, I hiked into the magic bus in Alaska. Uh, I poked lava with a stick in Guatemala and roasted marshmallows. That was a lot of fun. This is hiking in Chile, uh, in Peru actually. The highest mountain in Peru is right there in front of me. That was absolutely breathtaking. This is a really famous hiking circuit in Peru called the Cordillera Waiwash. I did a 10-day hiking lap. And there's glaciers galore. That mountain behind me is the mountain from Joe Simpson's book called uh, Touching the Void, where he's trying to climb that mountain and everything goes wrong. And his partner actually cuts the climbing rope. And so Joe falls thousands of feet uh, and he's left for dead. And so that is in rock climbing. That is one of the most famous rock climbing stories ever told. And, and that mountain is really famous. And I actually had read that book when I was a teenager in Australia. And so for me to be there, I still to this day pinch myself of like, is that even real? Did, did I actually do that? So that was a, a real amazing moment for me. Uh, next one, please, Al. Uh, the beautiful mountains in Torres del Pine in southern Chile. They're simply breathtaking and reminded me a lot of Alaska in funny ways. We'll go next one, please. I really loved hiking, so I did a lot of it down here in Patagonia because I wasn't ready for the trip to be over. This is called the Southern Patagonian Ice Field, uh, second largest in the world behind one in Alaska, and just staggering how far the ice stretches. Uh, next one, please, Al. And then that is Torres del Pine in Southern Chile. And I stopped to take that photo at about six o'clock in the morning. And because of that, I got delayed and the ranger station had opened. So I had to actually pay entrance fees. If I hadn't taken this photo, I would have got in without paying $50. The photo, I guess, is worth $50 because it's my favorite photo. <laughs> uh, next one, please, Al. All right. And then actually I looped back around to Buenos Aires and I sold my little Jeep to a French guy who was living there. Um, I could have shipped it back to North America, but to be honest, I was ready to do something else with my life and it just felt like the right thing to do. Um, and so that photo you see there, that's me at the airport in Buenos Aires. And I got on a plane a couple of hours after that photo was taken, you know, and that was the end of the trip. Um, so some stats there you can see on the screen. I drove right on 40,000 miles. It took almost two years in the end. Uh, I kept stretching it out and dipping into my savings because I was having such a good time. Uh, I visited 17 countries. They tried to bribe me probably about 40 times and I only paid once. Uh, it was a speeding ticket and I ended up, I gave the guys $5 and they became my best friends. And I probably slept in my tent, I'm going to say, about 75% of the time. Otherwise, maybe I got a cheap hotel room. Sometimes I, I met people who invited me to stay with them. Um, but mostly I was camping, and most of that was like just out in the wild for free. So I did a lot of free camping, which made it a lot cheaper. Uh, next one, please, Al. We all know breakups are really hard. And I'd been saying for the whole trip uh, about my Jeep, I'd been saying, ella esta mi novia, which is, she is my girlfriend. Uh, that's how I referred to my Jeep. So it was hard to say goodbye, but you know, 
Some days I dream about going back actually to see if I can find it. Uh, some interesting things, the Jeep got about 19 miles a gallon. Uh, once you leave North America, you're never gonna go above about 40 miles an hour anyway, maybe even 30 miles an hour. So your mileage gets really good, which is nice. I probably burned a bit over 2000 gallons of gas. Uh, I had about 14 flat tires. I was running cheap tires and they were always like a nail in the tread or a piece of steel or something. And so I plugged them or just had them patched. There's always guys on the side of the road in every little village. Uh, I did actually run out of gas once. Uh, I got to a station in southern Argentina and they didn't have any gas. I drove on anyway, kind of knowing I would run out. Uh, and some locals helped me. I put up my thumb, I hitchhiked. It took a couple of hours. It was no problem. Uh, and on the entire trip, the, ne the Jeep never broke down once, not a single mechanical issue. Uh, I did all the maintenance myself. So I did oil changes and tire rotations every 6,000 miles. And then at about the halfway point, I did a big round of oil changes. So like transmission, transfer case, diffs, and big inspection, and everything was fine. There was never a problem. So the Jeep was an amazing little vehicle for the trip. Uh, next slide, please, Al. We're getting really close to the end now. Uh, just for interest's sake, because I really like to show people it's not as expensive as you think it is. The entire trip, including shipping the Jeep from Panama to Colombia, including my flight back to Canada from South America, absolutely everything, I spent just over $27,000, uh, which is about $1,200 a month, which I always think is an interesting number because that's about how much I'd been spending to go to work every day before I left. So just paying rent and car insurance and gym membership and you know going to the bar twice a week, I was already spending $1,200 a month. So instead, I got to go and have this two-year amazing adventure for about the same amount of money. Uh, so it's, it's not as expensive as a lot of people assume it is. Uh, and I think it really is, you know, it's something if, if you save and you're really determined, you can make something like this happen yourself. I'm just an ordinary guy and I made it happen. So I like to say, you know, that means other people can make it happen too. Uh, next slide, please, Al. So really quickly, what's my advice for other people who want to get into, you know, overlanding and maybe even look at doing a bigger trip? I would say start out really simple like I did. Get out on the weekends, take your family, whatever it is you've got, and figure out what you need and what you love. You don't need a fridge. You don't need a rooftop tent. Maybe after a few trips, you'll figure out you want those things. Then you can go and get them. But don't assume that you need them right from the start because they are expensive and you can totally have big adventures without them if, if you don't have a need for them. Um, I would say try and find people who've actually done this kind of thing. There's lots of forums. Uh, Overland Expo is a really great place to meet people because the information you get from people who've done it is 10,000 times better than the information you'll get, you know, just from the news or from people who think they know what they're talking about, but you've never actually been, you know, to Costa Rica or wherever. Um, it's important to remember that it's not a wheeling trip. So you don't need to sort of gear up and plan the same way as you do when you're going out wheeling on the weekends. It's, it's more of like a long-term car camping trip. So in fact, luxuries are really important. You know, you want to have a good pillow. You want to sleep well. You want to think about how you're going to deal with mosquitoes. How are you going to stay happy even when it's pouring rain? Um, and wherever you go, if you're heading up to Alaska, if you're heading over to California, take your time. Don't try to cram in an enormous trip in just a month. Try to have as much time as you can and slow down and sink into it. Because the, the beauty of these kinds of trips is that you have time and, and you can just enjoy your time however you please. And, and some days, maybe you'll just sit in the shade and read a book. And that's a great way to spend a day. And you'll be really happy for it, I think. Um, next slide, please, Al. So if you are interested in getting into overlanding or into a big expedition like this, just lately since COVID, I've really been getting into YouTube. And so I'm publishing two videos every single day on my, uh, every single week on my YouTube channel, teaching you guys how to do this yourself. So all the information you need to, to cross the borders, to get your vehicle ready, to deal with bribery, to deal with drinking water, camping, every single topic that I've learned stuff about, I'm putting them all on YouTube. They're all totally for free. Uh, so head over to my channel. It's called The Road Chose Me. Hit subscribe and I'm going to teach you everything that I know about driving around the world so that you guys can get out there and do it as well. Uh, and yeah, that's all totally free. So 
And if you have, after tonight, if you have more questions and more things you want me to cover, absolutely feel free to send me a message. I'm really happy to help in any way I can and, and answer any questions that you have. And, and I'll film a video about any topic you want to know about. Um, so that's my little plug. Next slide, please, Al. And then also I've written a couple of books about what I've done. So the first one, The Road Chose Me, 40,000 Miles from Alaska to Argentina. This documents the trip I just talked about and all the characters I met along the way, all the lessons I learned. Kind of Latin America, they live a different life than we do. And so I learned a different perspective. Um, and then I've published a photography book from my Africa trip as well. Um, the written book from Africa, it's finished. I'm just waiting for the coronavirus to get out of our way before I release it. But the photography book and the written book of Alaska, Argentina, they are, they're available on Amazon right now for sale. You can order them up and you can get them in printed copy. That's a photo Al took actually from uh, the Africa photo book. Um, or you can get a digital copy of the written books as well. So you can read them on your Kindle or whatever. Um, so yeah, that, that brings an end to my talk. I think we'll go to questions now. Thanks again so much for having me. Thanks, Al, for organizing this. That was great, Dan. Thank you. I brought Mark on the screen also. Hey, Dan, how are you? I'm good, Mike. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here. First one I've got is from uh, Jay Bird, our president. Did you get sick along the way? Um, I got stomach bugs a few times because I was eating all the street food in Mexico. So, you know, e eating street tacos for five cents each. They are delicious, but yeah, I got stomach bugs and that's just kind of part of the deal, I think, if, if you're going to eat random food, but it was never terrible. It was all right. Awesome. Um, and then from Yvonne, how many free meals did you get just talking to the locals? <laughs> that's a good question. Free meals. They, they did invite me into their homes. They did always, they would say, no, 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 you can't eat by yourself. You have to come and join us. Um, so, I mean, a number, I don't know, maybe a hundred times. It was a lot. And people were always, wow. yeah, people were always super friendly. Just they'd go out of their way to be friendly and helpful. That's awesome. Mm. Uh, Holly Slade asked, is there any place that you didn't like? Uh, on the Latin America trip, Peru to me had a bit of a strange vibe, I remember. Um, when you get out in the countryside, they're, they're like a little bit sick of tourists, I think. So they maybe weren't as welcoming. Um, I'd have to rack my brain though. It was pretty rare that I would get somewhere that I didn't like. I guess big cities don't really appeal to me. So I would usually only spend one night or just kind of keep driving right through. But no, on the whole, I mean, it was amazing. Awesome. Um, Doug Callis asked, did you carry any protection just in, in case things got out of hand or were you allowed to while crossing into other countries? Mm. So, yeah, I should have addressed that. Um, carrying a firearm across international borders is highly, highly illegal, and there is no way that you can get a permit to do that. Actually, when you drive into Mexico, there are really big signs that say just carrying ammunition is a guaranteed jail sentence, let alone a firearm. If, if you had a firearm, you'll go to jail for a very long time in Mexico. So it's completely impossible out of the question. Um, I did have a can of bear spray that I had when I was hiking in Alaska. And so I had that under my driver's seat. But to be honest with you, it, it rolled away at some point and I totally forgot about it. It wasn't actually until like the last day when I was emptying out the Jeep and I found it under the driver's seat. And I was like, oh, I, I hadn't even set eyes on it in like a year and a half. So, I mean, although I had it, it certainly wasn't something that I found necessary or, or thought much about. Awesome. Um, Esther Newcomb asked, uh, where did you get gas while out there and did you carry extra in between gas stations? So my little TJ had a 19 gallon tank and got about 19 miles a gallon. So I could do 350 miles, uh, of range. And that was enough for the entire trip. I never carried a jerry can except on those salt flats. So because it was deep sand and kind of a bit unknown about the distances, I carried a five gallon jerry can just for that segment. And I just bought one locally for $10, you know, used it for the trip and then gave it away to a local at the end who was ecstatic. Um, so I, I didn't need, you know, that's a big thing I always tell people don't go crazy spending money on external gas tanks or 10 jerry cans. 
because you're just not going to need them. Yeah, yeah. And I think you addressed this, um, and I really like what you brought up. But Hope uh, Pope said, did you do any rock climbing with the Jeep during the trip? And you were kind of mentioning that you see stuff you want to do, but you're relying on your vehicle. It's kind of like your mechanical horse. So you're avoiding this type of stuff, really. That's right. Yeah. No, I never did anything that I would call like, you know, crazy four wheel driving. I mean, I use low range quite a bit just because, you know, it's more gentle on the machinery sort of over something really bumpy or, or to go slower. But I mean, anyone with any skill could have driven everything probably without even four wheel drive, to be honest. Um, so no, I, I didn't go looking for it and I, I wasn't really interested in it, to be honest. It just wasn't yeah. part of the trip for me. Yeah, mechanical sympathy in that realm really comes in because repairs could be a nightmare. Not only a nightmare, also really expensive. And like I was budget constrained pretty much when the money ran out, the trip was over. So, you know, a $500 Jeep repair, that's significant. That's, you know, two weeks on the road, three weeks on the road where like now I have less adventure. A question from Doug Callis. I think you said your Jeep never broke down, but it did. Did it ever give you any kind of trouble or anything like that? Never, not even once. That's awesome. Yeah, it was an amazing little vehicle. I, I kind of miss it some days. <laughs> so, and you answered this one uh, from Cammie. Um, you did carry extra gas across the salt flats, correct? That's right. Yeah, that was the one place that I needed it. Yeah, very cool. Brian Roberts uh, said, how was driving on the Alcan Highway? The... The Alcan itself, so the Alaska Highway, is it's paved the whole way now, and there are like thousands of RVs that do it every week. So the Alaska Highway itself is, it's, it's kind of epic and you feel special. But to be honest, it's when you get off the Alaska Highway that, that gets really special. So when you're in the Yukon, if you go up to Dawson City, then there's a road called the Top of the World Highway that goes, it's the most northerly border crossing between Canada and the U.S., and it goes through the mountains and it's a gravel road. And that is a really amazing road. Or from Fairbanks, if you go north on the Dalton Highway, that goes all the way up to the Arctic Ocean at Prudhoe Bay. And that, again, you're following the Alaska pipeline, you cross over the Brooks Mountain Range, and you, you start to look around and you think like, I've literally driven to the edge of the earth. This is <laughs> nuts. This is nuts. So yeah, it, it does get special up there for sure. That's awesome. Um, Karen Moody asked, did you encounter any of the wildlife along the way? Um, I saw a bunch of bears and moose when I was in Alaska. Uh, I never got, you know, too close. Um, there's a lot of monkeys in Central America. Uh, unfortunately, I never saw a sloth, which I still am disappointed about. I would love to see a sloth. Uh, and then, oh, things like toucans. They're, they're just like in the trees in Colombia. So you're camping and there's like a toucan with a beak like this big in the tree. <laughs> it's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it looks just like the Fruit Loops guy with like <laughs> the big, few colorful stripes on the beak. It looks exactly like that. That's so cool. Yeah. So that's, that's the last of our questions. Um, but you brought up some really good points. So um, my wife and I run Morrison's Outdoor Adventures and we do four-wheel drive training and outdoor training and stuff like that. And one of the one of the biggest things that we find with overlanding now being such a hot buzzword is, is you know, everybody sees and stuff on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. You've got to have this really expensive rig and all this gear to get out and adventure. But you did this with just a little two door TJ and some camping gear. You know, that's ex yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. It kind of like. Somewhere along the way, it got really commercialized and it kind of became about the gear. But I'm, I'm trying hard to bring it back in the other direction and say, the trip is more important than the gear. So, yeah. so focus on the trip, focus on what you actually need, and then get out there and, and have, you know, have an adventure because that's what it's all about. That's, that's really interesting because um, we, we meet a lot of people that have stock vehicles. You know, they just bought a Toyota Tacoma or a Toyota 4Runner. They have a Jeep. And their first question is always, what modification do I need in order to do this? And, and our comment normally right back to them is invest in yourself first so you have the skills you need. Because um, yeah. we say, you know, the vehicles are super capable in their stock form. They're way more capable than us as drivers could ever, could ever drive. Um, 
you know, so we always make the joke that it's a loose nut behind the wheel. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that is so true. And and even invest in yourself in like just the confidence to be like, yeah, I, I feel confident, you know, getting to camp and setting up a fire and, you know, setting up camp and then I'll be able to drive out of here and I'll be able to find drinking water and, you know, it's practice and training. Yeah, that's that's super awesome. One of, one of the things, um, I really like your YouTube channel. I've watched some of it. Um, and there's some awesome information on there. Uh, one of the things my wife and I are getting ready to do is start an overland budget build to show people, you know, you can go out and buy a high mileage vehicle for cheap and very little modifications. You can take it wherever you want to go uh, with the right skill sets and you can enjoy the outdoors because it is. It's about the experience. It's about the adventure and the memories that you can make doing that. That's right. Yeah. Someone commented recently, uh, so I'm going to just steal what they said. And so their advice was, the whole idea is to visit monuments, not to drive one. That's, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. I really like that. I really like that a lot. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's kind of funny because my wife and I met you in, U- in Uari uh-huh. uh, at American Adventurist event. And at the time, we were living in a house, and now we're traveling in an RV. Um, oh, nice. And we live in an RV full time. So, <laughs> and that's we, hilarious because because now I live in a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's super cool. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Um, your story is always so inspirational, and I think it really does push people to get out to the outdoors. Um, and certainly in this time with with COVID and everything, that's. That's where we can be and where we can social distance and we can we can spend time um, and really find ourselves out there. Exactly right. Yeah, we have this great opportunity right now. So, yeah, we should all take it, put some gas in the tank and go camping for the weekend. Yeah, most definitely. Great. Guys. Where, where are you now, Dan? Uh, I'm in British Columbia in Canada. So I, I'm pretty close to like Spokane in Washington. I'm like just over the border. Oh, OK. I just wanted to sneak that in. And remind us again how if we wanted to get one of your books, how would we do that? My books are for sale on Amazon. Um, And so someone could search my name, Dan Grek, or The Road Chose Me works as well. And yeah, you can check out the different books there. And then the YouTube channel as well is The Road Chose Me. Okay. So let's let's everyone tell Dan, thank you very much. Hmm. Uh, We're going to we're going to bring Jay and. and Bo back on the screen now and let them tell us a little bit more about some some top secret stuff related to Dixie Run. Uh, Dan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you off the screen and you and I can talk again later, okay? Thanks so much for having me, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I want to thank Dan. He is, that was just, at this point, you're just going to have to stop the tech nets because they can't get any better. I mean, how are you going to get better than that? That was like awesome. That was I mean, great, a that, great story, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, that uh, when I grow up, I want to be him. Tell us about Dixie Run, and I'll, I'll cue Bo when, uh, when it's Bo's turn to talk. We have got some exciting news. At, as soon as we are done, as soon as I give let's see, Bo the, um, the word, I know he can't hear me, but as, as soon as I give him the word, he is going to turn on Dixie Run registration. It's important to register now. Hey, Bo, I have got, I mean, it's not exactly what we're talking about, but Bo, can you uh, can you talk about this? Al, can you have him talk about what I have Bo, in my hands right here? Oh, tell us about that coin Jay's holding up. All right, Jay's holding up the special coin for the first 100 people that register for Dixie Run. We have a special limited edition coin for the first 100 people that register. Now, we will have a special event, only event coin. This is the first year that we've done it. Dixie Run event coin, a challenge coin. So these are going to be about (laughs) a two-inch diameter coin. Um, They're not perfectly round because we went with a specialized coin. Um, You we are only have 100 of each coin, so you are going to be able to order the event coin as many as 10. Uh, the system only lets us order 10, and there's a limit of 100. If they sell out, they might be all gone. I don't know. Um, 
but the first 100 people that register for Dixie Run will get a free special edition 100 registered coin. So, so Bo, the first yes, 100, sir. the first 100 that register will automatically get a coin for free, right? That is correct. You're going to get a coin with your registration. But they'll also be given an opportunity to purchase up one to ten uh, additional coins of a little different style. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, the uh, they'll be a little bit different style, and there's only 100 of those as well. So there is a, there's definitely a coin shortage at Dixie Run <laughs> for the challenge coins. <laughs> Have we set the price for those coins? We set the price for the purchase coins is ten dollars a coin. Ten dollars for the one coin. They're fantastic. They're worth way more than the ten dollars. Um, I've seen these coins go for twenty bucks, and they're definitely collectors' items. Um, like I said, there's a limited run of them. There's ten. There's one hundred. So once they're gone, they're gone. Now, if you are part of the first one hundred people that register, you get a free coin. Which means you got ten extra dollars to go buy not one but two of the event coins. Okay, great. Jay, All right. Else? Yes, yes. Okay. I hope you're still with me. I hope you haven't left the the this live feed yet. All right. I want to say thank you to BF Goodrich. They have been a sponsor of the TechNet series. They have been a sponsor to Southern Football Drive. They have donated to Dixie Run. Guess what we have for you? This is not the same set of tires that you're getting um, with with just watching this. We have another set of five BFG tires up to 37 inches to the first 400 people who register for Dixie Run. That's the only way to get in this set of tires. The only way is to register early. We need you to register early because we've got to know how many people are coming. And another thing I'm going to do just just, just for you tonight only. No, actually, we're going to make it $50 to, uh, to register for Dixie Run. It's going to be $50, a low price. It's pre-registered. It'll be higher at the door. But Dixie Run at Winrock, the first weekend in October, plan to be there. Get a challenge coin. Get a, the first 400. Get a chance to win a set of BFG tires. It's not going to be intermingled with watching the video. It's not going to be um, anything else. It is. It is going to be um, just just for this. So um, I'm thinking right now, uh, Al. Can you tell Bo to to hit that button? Bo, we're ready to hit the button. button. Registration is live. You can't see it because my phone won't show it. It is live. Registration is live. Go get them. Um, driver registration is fifty dollars. Your passengers fifty dollars. Kids under sixteen is free. Make sure you look at the box dinner. Get that Dixie Run T-shirt because you can't say that you were there without the T-shirt or your limited edition challenge coins. Yes, guys, as always with all of our TechNet series, um, this one is no different and probably just a little bit more important than the other TechNet series. Make sure that you help us spread the word about this. Al mentioned that the traffic's been really good. That's what's going to continue keeping these TechNet series going. If you're enjoying it, share it with your mom, dad, brothers, sisters, dogs, hairdresser, whoever. Share it with everybody. Tell them they need to watch these TechNet series so that we can continue doing this. Um, you know, we really enjoy it. We never expected them to kind of reach this far. Uh, and we would love to continue to see them grow and continue to reach. So please, 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 please share as much as you can. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming up. Make sure you get you register now. The first 100 get a coin. The first 400 get a chance to win a tires from, from BFG. So thank you so much, everybody. And thanks to Dan for, for absolutely a, a fabulous tech net. Say good night, Dan. Thanks so much again for having me, everyone. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you next week.